Well, this is all very intimate. Welcome. <laughs> See, please don't fall asleep uh, in those uh, more competent chairs. Try and bear with us um, for the duration of this afternoon. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Patrick Watkins, a member of the Mind Apples Board. It is a great pleasure uh, to chair tonight's panel discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank LexisNexis this evening uh, for their generous hospitality and support. Uh, it really is greatly appreciated and valued. Uh, we're also pleased that Mark uh, will also be on tonight's panel. So a little bit about how I became involved in Mind Apples. Uh, at a previous organisation, the issue of mental health and indeed mental well-being um, was growing in prominence and we were looking at ways in which we could engage people differently in how to look after their minds. It was actually one of our medical directors who recommended Mind Apples. And with that, we invited Andy to an exploratory meeting. Now, having worked with many people in the field, I have to admit to being slightly surprised when I first met Andy. <laughs> Louise had the same experience here. Uh, candidly, I did panic when a long-haired uh, hippie turned up to the offices. Guilty. And I thought to myself, how is this chap going to relate to investment bankers? <laughs> it was absolutely no surprise that he learned his trade at music festivals. Um, but he quickly challenged my perceptions and actually spoke effortlessly about the importance of looking after your mind. And it was from that point, I became a loyal disciple and advocate for what mind apples do. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the panelists uh, this evening. Um, let me start actually with Andy. Andy is the founder of, uh, of Mind Apples and the author of A Mind for Business. Before starting Mind Apples in 2010, he co founded the influential web startup School of Everything. And Wired magazine once named him the 78th most influential person. <laughs> <laughs> Although they did change their mind the year after. Um, his new book, A Mind, he fell off the list. His new book, A Mind for Business, is published by Pearson and was WH Smith's um, Business Book of the Month in March this year. And he's currently promoting the book alongside his familiar role as the CEO and head gardener at Mind Apples as well as a public speaker, trainer and campaigner for good mental health and smarter working in the UK and beyond. Uh, next um, on, the, on the panel is John Binns. Uh, John was an equity partner in Deloitte UK, before that a worldwide partner in Anderson Consulting, where he worked from 1994, always specialising in organisational transformation. Since 2007, based on his own personal experience, John has led a wide range of groundbreaking mental health and wellbeing initiatives. Uh, within Deloitte, which has been nationally and internationally recognised as leading practice. John is also a trustee of the mental health charity Mind and a, various, uh, and a member of various committees including the BITC uh, and Cent uh, City Mental Health Alliance. He is a sought after speaker, so oh, we're yes. delighted to have him this evening. <laughs> so, uh, an sure advisor to businesses, particularly in the professional services, technology, financial services and media organisations. Any other sectors, John, that you've missed there? Uh, uh, farming. Uh, farming, and, uh, farming, uh, farming yeah, yeah, and prison farming, services. Yeah. Um, looking to better address the management of stress in the workplace and promote um, the well-being and mental health of their people. John also plays in a rock band. I do. Yeah. Um, I haven't brought my guitar. You haven't, no, uh, but you will sing. Time time I'm, I'm led yeah. to believe. Uh, Natalie, works, uh, Natalie Banner. Uh, Natalie works in the policy team at the Wellcome Trust, where her primary focus is on if issues of ethics and governance in research. Prior to joining the Trust two years ago, she was a postdoctoral fellow at King's College London, undertaking research in the philosophy of psychiatry, specifically looking at the language of mental health and illness and how decisions are made about whether people have the capacity to make their own choices in a psychiatric context. Natalie has a long-standing interest in mental health and well-being and having enjoyed talking with Andy, I like this bit, about the relational autonomy and the meaning of the word unconscious, <laughs> Over several ciders, or oh, I think those two bits are definitely relate, related. Um, she joined the Mind Apples board earlier this year. Um, and finally, Mark Smith. Mark is representing uh, businesses this evening and our host for tonight at LexisNexis. Uh, Mark is the market development director for large law firms here at LexisNexis. Before joining the company five years ago, Mark spent 10 years as a lawyer, and then after completing his MBA, uh, uh, Mark worked as a consultant and service provider to the legal profession. With a keen interest in personal effectiveness, Mark is now in the final year of a master's degree in behavioural change and had played a key role in establishing LexisNexis's new coaching function. He is here with us tonight to give us a first-hand ex uh, experience and the realities of getting the best from people in high-pressure environment. Welcome to our panellists. Okay, Andy, I suppose we should better start with you uh, in terms of 
why you wrote the book and where it fits into Mind Apple's plans. Well, well, it's very kind of you to ask me about that and mention the book. Yeah, you know, I, I, in case you didn't know, I do have a book out, and uh, it's, I hear it's excellent. Um, yeah, it's it's come out of the the work we've done at Mind Apples. Absolutely, it's very much a Mind Apples book, um, and so I, you know, I say it's it, it feels to us very much like it's the result of three years of working with clients, actually, and and with staff and and the general public as well to find out what is most useful for people to learn about their minds to help them in their life and work. And that's we've straddled, I guess, across from, from helping people to be making better decisions at work and being more creative and you know, the dreaded doing more with less, but also to thinking about reducing stress and managing well-being. And I think the reason for doing a, a, a book and what we hope it, it will, will come from it is it's partly about building the prestige of this. And I think that the more... Um, you know, publishers like Pearson, and I think you know, Eloise Cook, the fact that Pearson have put their weight behind this and the fact that W.H. Smith have you know, picked it up as a business book for the month means that we're, we're showcasing that this is important, this is actually something that um, businesses are taking very seriously. So I, th I think the, the, the other reason for doing it is that there are a lot of books, as you know, about, about the mind and about different aspects of it, about you know, the power of habit, you know, thinking fast and slow, and um, you know, so many different strands of it, but we haven't seen anything that really brought it all together. And what we found is it's more effective when it's, it's all of it at the same, in the same place and with a kind of common theme across it all, because actually what we're finding is that people start to make connections. So they, you know, people will learn in our workshops about managing their moods and emotions, but then we'll, when we come to talk about creativity, we're talking about the effects of different you know, mood states on how creative you are, how well you can come up with ideas. We, we talk about decision making, but actually clearly decision making is affected deeply by stress and that changes our attitude to risk. So the, the stress module that, that we teach becomes very important. So actually it felt necessary to bring it all into one place and, and say, here is a view not necessarily the definitive view, but a view of how a person works. So if you are a person and you work, or if you are a person and you have other people working for you, it should at least give you the basics of everything that you need to know. It's a kind of user's guide, and that's the metaphor we've always taken. And that's what we're hoping, is that people will find that they can learn about themselves, and as a result of that, get more done and feel better. So that's our hope. Great. Thanks, Andy. <coughs> John, if we maybe just kind of start with you, you've worked with some big organisations, Anderson Consulting, and indeed uh, Deloitte more recently. Why is it you think businesses now are taking such an interest in this, this area? Not just mental health, but mental well-being as well. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a number of things going on in parallel, which, uh, which, which, are, which are making this sort of a moment in time where things are beginning to change. Um, I think one of the first things is that in terms of recognising that actually mental ill health uh, is far more common within business than anybody's ever been prepared to talk about it. There is an increasing recognition of that fact and that increasing recognition is coming about as a result of a number of things. One, that there are an increasing number of people who are prepared to talk about their own experience and through talking about their experience demonstrate that uh, it happens it happens to people who perhaps don't fit a stereotype that people had in their line before, and that people can go on to contribute massively. So that's one thing. Second thing is, you know, there have been some excellently run campaigns, essentially, you know, through Mind Where Our Trustee uh, and the Time to Change campaign, really focusing very professionally on this issue through business and the community and the work that, uh, that in fact, both of you have done in that area. Uh, to actually go on the front foot to bring this to the attention of business. Uh, and I think thirdly, the, the recognition that actually there is a business case for getting this right, both in the context of helping to prevent mental ill health, but also to recognise, to your point, and you know, it comes through very strongly in your book, the importance of mental health uh, as something that we all have, and I know that's your line, and I'm sorry if I've all stolen have, it, but you know, uh, that, that we all have, and that actually a lot of this is about keeping more of us at the top of our game for more of the, the, the time in our business uh, as possible, and as few as possible in that bracket that you might call ill. And an increasing recognition 
uh, by business, that that's really good for the people, but it's actually you know, good for the bottom line. And in your experience, how do you get senior leaders engaged in this agenda? Because so much of what's done in organisations is that really kind of the interests of, of the senior leadership. So in your experience, how have recent <coughs> organisations do that really well? I mean, the, the, the first point is actually to recognise that that is, that is the fact. And that if this um, debate is one which uh, lives within the HR function within an organisation, and I'm, by the way, I'm, for those of you who are from HR, I'm not kind of knocking HR. It's absolutely critical that HR understand this, support it. But if it's only HR, there's a huge issue. So the first thing is recognising that it's got to be taken beyond HR. And then it is, you know, get, getting... Um, credible voices in front of senior management teams to make that business case. And my experience has been, yes, of course, um, you know, there's, a, there's years and years of stigma about talking about mental health, the mind, why it might be important, why it might go wrong. Uh, but actually, when you do get in front of people, it becomes relatively self-evident that some of the things that we're talking about ought to be done. The issue is getting in front of them in the first place. Once you're in front of them, actually, quite often, people recognise it makes sense. So, Mark, um, from LexisNexis's perspective, um, what are kind of your experiences of how to kind of engage senior leaders in this, in this agenda? And what have been some of the, the challenges that you've come up against? So, so I think one of, the, one of the interesting angles is our parallels and our customers. So, speaking to our senior leaders about our customers and their challenges is a way of immediately engaging in a, a discussion that talks their language. And for us at Lexus and for our customers, we share similar characteristics and, and fundamentally we are knowledge businesses. And, and from my perspective, I think it's hugely impactful to talk about um, that improving that baseline. So where is it that mental wellbeing and mental health can drive competitive advantage? And there is so much focus in business um, that has been looking at the processes and the operating models of the business. Fundamentally, once those gains are achieved, you're down, you're down to the people. So, so I think fundamentally, neuroscience now is supporting a dialogue which substantiates what people, as you say, instinctively know that if you look after people and get them working at the top of their game, your organisation is going to be more successful. And so for us as a, you know, a, a knowledge business which cares about and invests in our employees and wants to perform at the top of our game and wants to beat our competition, our employees are the heart of that. And so to the extent now we can have some solid proof and have a, a research-based dialogue that says, look, you know what, if we do these things, people will make better decisions. If we do these things, people will be more present and more engaged. The link between organisational engagement and high performance is well established. So I think more and more, it's a very powerful, persuasive argument. And it's one that, if you frame it not just for us, but for our customers as well, you get a, a set of commonality in a language that business understands. So you make the business case sound compelling. Yep. So I suppose kind of the big question is then, why are so many businesses still struggling to kind of take the first steps in this case? And, and I, think, I think it is compelling. It's, if you look at the, the neuroscience and a lot of what's in Andy's book, so much of that has accelerated in the last 10 years. There, there still remains a gap, to my mind, in quantifying the benefits. So we can show that if you behave in certain ways and if you teach people certain things, their performance goes up. Where I think the gap remains at the moment is quantifying that in a business sense. So we can show if you're more engaged and you make better decisions, performance goes up generally. But there is still a gap about quantifying that. And I think that's the next area that will help people take the step. The other thing is I think we are getting to a point where there is a critical mass of big companies already doing this. And I think that absolutely goes a long way. There is still more to do with getting that message across. So one of the, when I've talked to people about this, one of the most powerful examples is, of course, Google and their, and their work on the Search Inside Yourself program. And what I love about that is um, 
uh, as they frequently say, Google is one of the most data-driven organizations in the world. And the very fact that they have been able to show internally that this model makes sense for them, I think is a hugely powerful. We just need more organizations like that able to come out and say, whether it's a, a Google, whether it's a Deloitte, whether it's a Booper saying, we've done this, these are the results, try it for yourself. So, so Andy, one of the things that I know Mind Apples have been trying to develop is an evidence base. You know, what's kind of the so what of some of these interventions? Um, maybe you just want to kind of talk a bit about some of that experience with York University. Yeah, so it's, um, briefly, because actually, I mean, I think Natalie may have more to say on this as well, having an actual research background rather than me as an entrepreneur. I mean, you know, I run the company, why would you believe a word I say? Um, but there is, uh, I think we're trying to make, as, as many organizations in this space are, we're trying to make a real effort to actually, not just to quantify, but to understand what the benefits are. Because what we've found is actually the benefits go in all kinds of different directions. And some, some companies, they're looking to incre improve collaboration and creativity. Others are looking to reduce stress. Sometimes it's about increasing motivation. So people take from it what they want. And we, we even sorted out someone's golf swing. Which, um, I don't quite know how you measure that or do a controlled study on it. But you know, I, he was very excited about it. But what we have managed to show is we've done some, some studies with the University of, of York um, uh, doing uh, assessments of our work with nursing students, so people who are about to enter the clinical professions funded by Guys at St. Thomas' uh, charity. And uh, we've, uh, we've got good statistical findings that we've imp imp improved well-being in the intervention group compared to the control group, including during exam pressure times and actually after three months later as well. And the ability to manage stress has been particularly impacted by it. So we're clearly onto something, but there are actually many other things we could be measuring. And that's, that's the interesting complexity of it. When you're talking about minds, it's actually, they're useful for a lot of different things, it turns out. So, you know, it turns out they can be, the, the training that teaches you about them can be also useful for many different things. So Natalie, as Andy says, you do come from a research background, so be very interested to know your perspective on this and the evidence base that sits behind um, looking after your mind. Sure, well I think some, some people may question the wisdom of having a philosopher on a panel from whom you're seeking answers, but I'll, um, <laughs> I'll my do my fault. best. <laughs> um, and I think it, it probably draws on, my, my, my comments really probably draw on what, what Andy was just saying about we can measure lots of different things. Um, well-being fundamentally it's quite a woolly concept right it, getting to grips with actually what it means what well-being is in practice also mental health mental health well-being woolly fuzzy concepts um, and I think that actually fundamentally makes well it has three implications the first which I think we've already spoken about was is the sort of well how do you actually then uh, assess evaluate quantify the impact on your business on your staff um, in practice, what what, you, what what does a program such as the Mind Apples program actually do in practice? That that's pretty hard to to quantify, and I think you know, the other panelists have sort of already spoken to that. Um, the second, I would say, is that it indicates we've got a real paucity of of positive, rich language with which to talk around mental health and well-being. And I come from a philosophy background, so I'm going I'm going to talk about language. Um, most conversations about mental health happen in a negative context. There's, there's discussion about stress in the workplace, dealing with anxiety, depression, making reasonable accommodations and so on for people who have particular problems. And what I think this indicates is that um, we don't have a particularly good emotional or cognitive literacy. And by that, all I really mean is the ability to talk about how we think, feel and make decisions. Uh, we don't really understand generally how, how we do these things. Um, and because we don't have that kind of literacy, it makes businesses quite reluctant to, to, to go there, frankly. It seems to be, you know, sort of slightly murky, murky territory. Um, and actually, I think that by developing that kind of literacy, by understanding a little bit more about how the mind works, um, even sort of quite basic terms, you're going to develop an ability across an organisation, not just for individuals, but to sort of develop a kind of the, the, the organisational culture and so on that might enable people to have those conversations, to be able to recognise things in themselves, recognise how they're making decisions, recognising what happens to them under stress and have a conversation about it in terms that aren't just couched in the negative, the stress, the anxiety, depression and so on. Um, but as Andy says, actually kind of measuring what those impacts are is, is extremely difficult to do. Um, certain certain facets you can um, you, know, you can sort of get assessment scales and things like well-being, ability to cope with stress, and so on. But 
the wonderful thing is that the mind does does an awful lot of things. Um, so I think that developing that kind of language around how we talk about mental health is actually something that uh, could be really can can be very powerful. Demystifying the notion of well-being, so it's not this sort of fluffy, vague notion that people say, "Oh yes, well of course we should do something about that." Actually, finding something concrete you can do to improve conversations can actually have a really powerful effect. There's actually just to add one thing about that. I think a good analogy for it is the difference between training and education. Like again, sort of fuzzy concepts, but perhaps best sort of understood as if if training is about practicing a skill or you know being told there's a set of things steps that you go through and then you get better at them education actually changes how you see the world and so it, it gives you concepts and tools and a better language for working on it and it's much harder to evaluate the value of education so actually we don't we don't have controlled studies to see what the benefits are of going to school versus not going to school we just take it as read that it is important for people to have a good coherent worldview and the tools for managing their reality um, but what we do do is we say we want schools to help you know, produce people who are better at, at creativity or, or better at languages or better at sciences. So we pick particular things that we want schools to be good at teaching people, but we don't overall evaluate it. And I think to some extent what we're doing here with Mind Apples is backfilling the education a bit that we should really have been taught a lot of basic things about how our minds work, what is stress, what is a mood, what, how does motivation work. These are basic things to make sense of reality. And actually, of course, they're going to go in many different directions because it's basic education. It's fundamental to how we do everything. And just also to pick up on that, that um, you know, the neuroscience is not fixed. It's, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly developing. And, the, and I think certainly that yeah, the book doesn't provide sort of solid answers to say, oh, right, well, we've, we've sussed the brain out now. Great. This is how it all works. But it's part of an ongoing conversation, ongoing development and developing the, the, the capacity, the ability to understand more about how, you, how your mind works even though there is an awful lot about the brain we don't yet understand, can be a very positive thing. John, in terms of your experience, obviously Deloitte, accountancy consulting business, very much into the numbers, some of the organisations that you work with, again, very kind of financially driven. Do you see now kind of the compelling need to develop an economic case for intervening and doing something? Or actually, do you think there's a growing kind of moral case for looking after um, people in an organisation and seeing some of the benefits that Mark referred to in terms of improved productivity and, and performance? I personally think they have to run hand in hand and I think in business you, you need to be sort of going forward on both 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 feet uh, and there, I think there is progress in both elements of that and growing awareness when I, when I talked about the kind of mind type campaign about why actually this is something that you know, ill health Mental ill health is something that touches many more of us than we're all prepared to talk about. And actually, anyone in this room, you start talking, will know somebody, etc., etc. So the moral case is important and is making ground. Uh, but I think also the business case will always be critically important as well. Um, my experience of um, what's out there and what's not is that it's actually very difficult to make broad, general um statements using large amounts of quantitative data, I think, that, that get traction around why an organisation should behave in, in, in a particular way. My own experience is, uh, and it may be just that I'm not good enough with quantitative data, but my own experience is that tying it into very specific scenarios that relate to the business that you're talking to is more powerful. And if to think about, okay, let's take a situation, and let's take a situation that works in your business, what are the KPIs associated with a particular individual? What's their sales target? What is it they're supposed to produce? Now let's think about your culture. What would normally happen if something happened, went wrong in this area? What would you do? And actually costing, and I did that within Deloitte, and I've done that with a number of professional services organizations, are saying almost what's the cost of getting this wrong? You've got to, how, how would you describe your culture? Well, your culture is essentially if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And you all think that's really good for the business, do you? Mm, well. Let's just play that through and let's take whatever it is, a seven year partner and say a pattern that often happens with someone beginning to suffer with stress. What's their productivity? What's their KPIs? And we got to some amazing figures actually within Deloitte. I've got to be careful not to betray too many of the internal. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you take a view that what typically happens when someone is beginning to underperform and getting into a position where they might actually uh, 
fall off a cliff, there's often an 18 month lead into that seat, so time and time and time again, often a two to three months out of the business. And if your kind of view of the world is you exit the person at that point, the costs associated with that in terms of presenteeism, in terms of replacement, getting a new person in, paying that person off. For Deloitte, for a partner with seven years, it, it, it was about seven million. And I did that in front of a bunch of auditors and said, so I've added up all these bits. The underperformance, while they were the, the, the exit cost, putting a new person in, what target will you give the new person? I asked them, do you give the new person after you've exited this guy the same um, targets as the, the previous person? No, well, what do you do, 25%, 50%, what is it? About 50% in year one. What's the sales target in year one? Three million, so the other guy says, you've lost 50%, that's one and a half million. You add it up and poof. Sorry, I talked a lot about that, but I think the point I'm trying to make is tailoring it to the organization that you're having the conversation with, working out what their KPIs are, and then playing out a scenario and say, do you really want it to look like that? Mark, again, just kind of looking at LexisNexis and what, and what you've done, um, it seems the focus is not just on avoiding kind of mental ill health, but it's really kind of focusing on the opportunities to improve kind of people's mm -hmm. Mental well-being. Um, how have you gone about that at LexisNexis? So there are a number of strands to that. The work we've done with Mind Apples has come out of um, an organisation, uh, an initiative called the Happiness Lab, which is specifically focused on developing employee well-being. That works hand in hand alongside various initiatives from our HR team, but also what you see is pockets of excellence around the business that have sprung up by individual team leaders, individuals within the business who just have a passion and, and believe in it. And I think as, as organisations get more complex, then that type of blended approach has, has got to be the way that these things work. Because you know there are very few organisations these days with such a rigid, old-fashioned command and control hierarchy. And in an organization like ours, where it's a matrix organization, things are constantly shifting. It's important that we build that capability in a flexible way that will change with the organization. And so you know, to pick up on your point, what's right for our organization is not <coughs> what's right for every organization. Yeah. Um, and similarly with our, with our customers, what we see with some of the law firms are there are law firms that in a particular point in time, the challenge that they are focusing is dealing with the illness. It, it's, it's resilience. We've had a lot in our professional press in the last week about the long hours culture in the law firms. Um, it was one of the things that made me leave private practice when I did. Um, yet there are also customers that we see that have visionaries in there who are going way beyond that, who are looking at creativity. How can we beat our competitors by being more innovative, by really pulling people up to the next level of performance. And again, I don't think there's any one conversation that is right for every business. Um, it, the flexibility, to my mind, is a, is a key uh, a key success factor in this. So just before we, we kind of open the um, <clears throat> everything up for, for questions, um, so we start thinking of, of questions. Uh, <laughs> Andy, I mean, in terms of this, this space, there is growing recognition of the importance of supporting employees with their mental well-being. Um, to the extent now that I've heard someone kind of brand mindfulness as mindfulness. Um, mm. Where do you see mindfulness sit as part of this discussion and indeed how it relates to the work that you do with, with mind adults? It's, it's interesting the way that the, the word mindfulness is being being used now. And we talked a bit, you know, with, to colleagues here at LexisNexis and, and to Mark as well, and we, we talked about this last week. But um, what we're finding actually is that we're, we're pretty clear on what we do, that we're not teaching meditation. We are teaching people to be more aware of what's going on in their minds, but we do that through giving them models and language and things to pay attention to. So we're not teaching a practice of attention training. But if you put it alongside mindfulness, then it can make it easier for you to get a language for talking about what you are noticing, and then that makes it easier to talk to your colleagues or your manager. So there's the, there's the social level of it, which I don't think is really captured in the kind of individual practice of being, being more mindful. 
which I think is really important. But we're just finding people are, are, are referring to us as a mindfulness company. And I used to sort of say, well, we're not a mindfulness company. No, no, no. And then I realized that what they meant was you teach people more about how to be aware of their minds. And then I go, oh, we actually, we are, we are that. So, I mean, the, my, my colleagues who work in mindfulness hate the idea that we would be a mindfulness company, but I'm finding it quite useful, actually. <laughs> so I guess we're sort of are in this broader definition of it. And I think it's being used as a, I think it's a, I think it's a gateway to talking about something deeper and broader than, than purely about meditation. It's about... Are you aware how you feel? Are you aware how you're thinking? Are you aware of the behavior that's resulting from that? And, and are you aware, aware of what you, how your, your behavior and your thoughts affect the way that you feel? And if that's what mindfulness means, then we're all on board. You know? one, of the, one of the things I've found when discussing this type of issues with some of our customers is um, it links in a number of themes we've had. So it, it links in the need for a common language that, that you're making, which is... Um, already that that word, I think because it is used in the media, has a certain set of characteristics associated with it. And people interpret those very differently. And coming back to the point about needing to tailor your approach for your different organisations, there are some organisations where, despite the fact that you can go into the mindfulness and there's a whole huge research base there, in, you know, fully neuroscience backs and peer-reviewed and the like, the word itself will turn people off and they will have you know certain things that they associate with that. Other people, it's a great gateway in and it works and they associate it with something very current and very modern and very now and the, the kind of Google work that I associate with. Great way into the conversation. But I think that that really highlights the importance of choosing your language carefully and one, choosing a language that is right for the context of the organisation you're working with. Great. So at this point, um, we thought we'd open it up to the floor. And then it'll go with it. It's got this one, one, two, exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm interested that you talked about how to tailor the, the case um, for Michael's mind levels to organisations, but that presupposes a degree of interest in the first place. How do you, I mean, this, this conversation reminds me about conversations that you have about work life balance or anything else where we say there is a business case or something that equals a life of working practices. How do you actually make the case in places, very, very alpha environments, where bullying culture is rife, where you've got the kind of performance from top to bottom uh, approaches that still, I accept they're not all command and control organisations in terms of setup, but I've worked in very, very alpha <coughs> environments where bullying was rife but not named as such. Um, and I think if you walked in and talked about mind apples in those environments, you'd get laughed out of court. So, how do you actually even get in in the first place before you start telling your, your approach? Do you have a preference in who you want to answer that question? Whoever has something enlightening to say. <laughs> well, I, I will say one thing. I don't know how enlightening it is, but you know, I, I will say one thing about the kind of going into cultures where you might where, where there are a lot of cynics there, and actually that's kind of where we started. And I think um, <coughs> what we found is that it's actually about talking about uh, understanding the tool that you use to to do your work, um, not about well-being, not about health. So we've we've gone in slightly, but you know, around that. So whereas. And I think you know, what you're doing, John, is a bit more about engaging people and talking about the ethical case and the business case of taking better care of people. What we're actually talking about is you know, how much do you know about your mind and how important it is, you to, is, is, is it to you to make money. And we've gone into companies where really people didn't care at all about their work-life balance and to talk to them about why it was important for them to maintain their minds better because otherwise they, they didn't know when it was going to affect their judgment, that was going to affect their work, and so that was going to cause them problems. And the, the trick is just getting through the door. I think once you're, once you're through the door, a nice, clear, hard-edged message like that seems to work. The problem is that, obviously, we're, we're frequently talking to individuals, at least in, in these cynical companies, who are very passionate about this and get them out more. Okay, so how do you get in there in the first place? I mean, it really just builds on the point you were making, actually, that a good example of how it can work, something can work presented in one way and absolutely not work presented in another, it comes to the language point. Um, there was a couple of times when, in the, in, in the early days of mindfulness, but where uh, within Deloitte, we um, recognised a number of us who would regard ourselves as more enlightened, recognised that this actually could be good for the business. It would be helpful in terms of creativity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The first session that we put on, we got about four people turned up for it. 
because the language that we used was entirely wrong. The language talked about its Eastern tradition, it, it linked it back to kind of meditation, it linked it back to, and no one turned up. We put on exactly the same session, exactly the same people talking about exactly the same things, but build it using some rather macho kind of terminology about sharpening your edge. <laughs> <laughs> Four partners sharp with their edge, maintaining your edge, keeping your mind fit for success, beating the competition, using blah, blah. And we had a full audience. And it was it. So it goes back to, you know, having to compromise to a degree with the culture of the organization you're trying to work with and then seeking to get your foot in the door and move it on. And I think as well there is... Sorry to, to say again, but very briefly, that there's a privacy <coughs> question as well, and we we titled the, the, this debate "Whose Business Is Wellbeing?" partly to, to to reflect that a bit. That I think if your starting point is going, we as employers care about what's in your mind because it affects our bottom line, then I, I think people will very rightly be deeply suspicious of you. Um, whereas if you're talking about the practicalities, the work, it gets a lot easier to get around that. So. Well, I, as far as I'm concerned, I only need to know about what's going on in your head if it affects your behaviour and the way that you interact with me. Apart from that, it's your own business. So in, in terms of that, I think that helps. It just don't make people nervous by thinking you're trying to trying to, trying to to get into the inside their minds. As to, I'm, a, I'm a historian, actually, by original background, and uh, Elizabeth I, when she was making the church settlement in 1559, uh, with all of these people trying to kill each other over various particular key points of theology that we've forgotten now, um, she said, I do not wish to make windows into men's souls. And I think you have to have that approach to promoting well-being. Margaret Matlini, further? Yeah, just to, to echo Andy's point that, that um, again, coming back to the language, that, that, that these, this sort of, these kinds of initiatives could, could seem intrusive. You know, who's, it, what business is it for yours? What's going on in my head? But actually, um, the point for, for business is very much around how is this affecting productivity? How is this affecting your staff's ability to do a good job in what they're trying to do. Um, and beyond that, and well-being, it can, it can be a very personal matter. Of course it can. But that's not the, that, that part of it is not really the, the business of business, as it were. So again, it's, it sort of comes back to this point about language and understanding what we mean by, by well-being in the first place. An employer interested in, in, in well-being uh, wouldn't necessarily have business knowing you know, too much about a person's personal life and, and, and getting the, the language right around what the aim is of being interested in well-being, that it's about the business, it's about your productivity and so on, is really important. Um, from, from my point of view, I come back to this, what's the business imperative? And, you know, in the, in the industry, the profession that I know best, which is the law, and there are plenty of very alpha law firms out there if, um, you know, that I know very well, the conversation there is what matters to them. And for example, a lot of the firms, what matters to them is how different they are. And uh, you can frame quite a challenging conversation for them, which is you know, what that culture expects, which says, you know, if you look at you and your nearest competitors, your offices are all in the same place. You all use the same system. You all do the same work. What is it that's different about your business from your competitor? Why are the clients going to hire you? And they'll very quickly come down to their people. And, and the question is, what are you doing to really get the best out of that asset? And framing, framing it, A, in a challenge which is um, compatible with their culture, and B, really focusing on the drivers, come back to John's point, what matters in that individual context, which for the, for the businesses I know best is about how to beat the competition, how to be different, how to be you know, more creative. That's that's the lever. I think going in with anything softer is going to meet resistance, but focusing it on a real business imperative. Ultimately, if what you're telling me is your people are the difference between you and your competition, how are you going to make them better? How are you going to get them to perform you know, at the leading edge? Yeah. So, uh, Ted Smith from the Wellcome Trust. Um, one of the things that we do is actually fund some of the research that's going on. And um, I'm sure all of you would be quite interested to know that, um, that there is about to be some quite large amount of funding going into mindfulness training being taught in schools to adolescents so that you get in early before people even start talking about whether or not they've got a mental health issue themselves. My question to you then, related to that, is if I gave you £5 million, 
what would you spend it on related to research in the work in the workplace? Obviously, each of you would be uh, very interested to hear how you'd spend your five million. Is it unfair to ask your colleague? <laughs> yeah, I, no, I think that's what you should say first. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> John? Hmm, that is a big question. Because I suppose, in some ways, the reason that I'm struggling to answer that, I'm not, I never want to turn away money, but I'm not 100% <laughs> certain that this is a question of having lots of money thrown at something. Right, you're, you get off the panel. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Give it all to Andy. <laughs> Buy a lot, um, a lot of copies of his book. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is clearly more that can be done in terms of education and getting people to understand this. So, so campaigning, getting stuff out there. I'm not sure it will be worth spending £5 million on more and more research about the business case, because although we've all talked about the fact that there's a business imperative to do this, I think actually it's getting in there and having the conversation. I think once you're in there and having have the conversation, people generally get it if you tailor the, the conversation. So a massive research project which was designed to show how productivity went up by X percent if you did this, that, and the other. I wouldn't spend it on that. So I'm telling you some things I wouldn't spend it on. There's some thoughts. Yes, that's right. There's some thoughts. I'll come back to you when I have a better idea. Yeah. But, but, but I think there is something in that. You know, that, just, that, that. Is this just a money thing? Or is it actually an influencing getting in front of people thing? And I actually think it is more of an influencing getting in front of people thing. So I, so I do have a very specific answer, <laughs> yeah, um, and, and that's because it's something I, I'm care, I, I, I care deeply about. So there is, a, um, there is a therapeutic framework called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which is described as a, a kind of next generation of cognitive behavioral therapy. And within that, there is a particular um, tool called cognitive diffusion, which uh, again, covered in a lot of different areas as well. Mindfulness covers it, and it's about teaching people to separate from their thoughts and, not, and understand mental events as mental events as cognitions. Um, I would like to, I would spend half my five million pounds teaching this to a vast number of professional people and then I would spend the other looking at lots of different outcomes of that so um, but also as well as uh, on an individual level I would like longitudinal studies of how businesses perform so I think that would give a, an area of research that really hasn't been done before a lot of the research at the moment looks at a particular group of people and um, different behavioral characteristics and results from that what I think we haven't had at all is actually if you look at a, a, an organization-wide initiative how does the organization do and come back to kind of business classics like the you know the good to great that looks at organizations over a 25 year period i think it'd be fascinating to see if you've got some really high quality um, mental health education and teaching in early and then follow the business over time what difference would that make i think that'd be fascinating to the academic Andy, I'm going last. Well, he, wants, he wants 400,000 books. Is that <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would follow up on that point that, that the longitudinal impact would be really, really interesting to understand because um, knowing, how, knowing what sticks, how people actually take on board messages around how their mind works, it's great to leave a session and think, oh, I understand that. I, I, I know how I can deal better with my manager now or that I need to quit my job because my manager's awful um, is one thing. But knowing how it will impact on people over time, how it will change individuals and also how it will change businesses would be very, very interesting to do. So I think longer term evaluation and follow up on this kind of programme would be great. The other thing I'd spend the money on is a public mental health campaign, personally, because I think that the, uh, the argument for having these conversations is more of a part of the way we talk about physical health, going to the gym, looking after ourselves would be extremely valuable. Mental health should not be something that is confined to a small proportion of the population who might be struggling, who might have difficulties. So actually a, a bigger public mental health campaign around uh, talking about mental health in positive terms, we all have it. It's something that, that everyone, have, everyone who has a mind has mental health, as Andy says. Um, so uh, a, a campaign to try and um, uh, develop this conversation beyond just the 
negative, I think would be a valuable use of the money and obviously to evaluate it to see if it works. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, Lib, the Lib Dem manifesto does contain a wonderful new idea that they've had, which is to do a five a day campaign for the mind, um, <laughs> which I don't know where I don't know where they got that from. It's amazing. Um, where do they think of these ideas? Um, so, yeah, the, the public health campaigning thing is because the attitudes are not necessarily um, there for people to even think that they can affect their minds. You know, we, we sort of there's, a, there's still a big story about it being about brain chemistry and you know nothing that you do really makes a difference. It's just something. It's just genetic, isn't it? Or it's just people moaning. Or you know, unless we break down all of that and start helping people to realise actually what I do affects how I feel and how I think and how I how I behave, then all the evidence in the world won't won't really help. The thing that I think. I, I agree about the business case. We don't need more business cases. Like we, we know that there is a business case and it's different for every company and yet it is still there, which means it's the most robust you could ever get, really, because what, how many other things could you say that about? You know, chairs, maybe? I don't know. Like even Some companies don't even need chairs. You know, they all need minds. Um, I, would spend, I would spend money understanding more about the effects of learning about how your mind works on your thoughts, feeling, behavior, your well-being, your performance. So spend some of it on looking at whether learning about mental functioning and you know the basic understanding of yourself helps young people with their future life chances. Do a study properly on that to see whether it helps you in building good relationships, keeping jobs, you know, managing your health better. Does it help with all of those kinds of things that we care about for young people? And also, does it help in, in that sort of more practical business context as to help people get more done? Because um, I think I mean, mentalization and psychoeducation would be the sort of two areas to draw from. The trouble is a lot of that is done by academics who aren't experts in communication or education. So we need to get really, really beautifully made content and evaluate that, not just evaluate something that someone from an institution has come up with because they want to teach people about sleep. You know, if you let's assess whether really doing brilliant, high quality education and communication about this massively improves people's quality of life and work. That's what I'd spend it on. And a hovercraft. I think if I can pitch for the five million as well. <laughs> We're going to run out of time for questions, but this is important. <laughs> It'll be a short one if the chair can get away with doing this. But um, I think coming out more from a commercial viewpoint, I think the business case has been made. I think the gap is actually helping businesses understand what works. You know, there's lots of options out there for businesses that want to kind of go in this, this road, but actually understanding what's going to be the most effective for their business is of critical importance. And, and whilst you know, academically, 25 years' time will you know, get much greater insight. I think there is immediate need now to help businesses understand, okay, what is my first step? Susan. Oh, um, it's kind of a follow-on question, partially from what you just said and a little bit to what the panel has been talking about. So I find that the emotional business case on a human level is so absolutely there, right? And um, pretty much anyone you meet knows someone is someone um, and feels it when you talk about when someone is unwell. Um, in the, guaranteed, we all have mental health, but when we're talking about the un, unwell side. Um, similarly, when there is an issue, people act and generally do the right thing. But where I find, and I'm, I'm curious as to the panel in terms of ideas or what you've seen work is, is, is the solution teach a lot of individuals that self-awareness, right? And they walk away with confidence and capability when it comes to their own men mental health. Or have you come up against um, business systems which are leading to poor mental health or good mental health, right? They're either fueling it or feeding it you know, in, in the wrong type of ways or the right type of ways. And what I mean is the root cause, right? You can, you can fix the symptom quite frequently with people and, and I see businesses and business leaders say, oh yes, and then they will help because the empathy is there and they want and they get it. But getting all the way back up to the root cause of what the issue was that was causing or is causing the widespread mental health challenge is an interesting one. Do you have much experience or examples of that? Because I think that's the practical examples that organizations are looking for to say, what can we change that can affect 5,000 people at once? You know. Or is it just teaching everyone their own? I mean, I, I've got a couple of thoughts on this. I mean, the, the way the way I think about that, and, and I do I do quite a lot of one-to-one uh, -one confidential uh, advice to people within organisations who think they might be potentially suffering from stress-related anxiety and depression. I've done that for five, six, seven years. Now. So themes that I see are very, very common, and the kind of way I now visualize it is almost into kind of two buckets. 
So there's, there is, there's, there, 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 the themes are very common, and there's a bucket of stuff which is stuff the business didn't really ought to be doing because it ain't good for the business and it's not good for the individual. Uh, and that might be themes like you know, a sense of isolation, people feeling that they are not part of a team. They're either geographically isolated from their colleagues or they're culturally excluded from their college or by colleagues or by a set of skills they felt they feel they don't fit in. Uh, people who don't, uh, people not getting feedback so they don't know whether they're doing a good job and or not. Now this is stuff which, you know, should be fed back to the business and said, you know, why on earth would you be doing this? It's not good for your profit line, it's not good for your people, it's just not good. There's another set of stuff which I would have as it's the bucket marked, it's just what it's like around here, which are some stuff which simply isn't going to change. It is by its nature part of the environment that the person is in. An example for uh, in a big city professional services organisation, whether it's a big law firm or whether it's a big accountancy firm or a big bank, is matrix management. I see it time and time again people saying, one of the things that I really find it hard to deal with is multiple taskmasters, I've got lots of people coming up to me throwing stuff at me. Well, I believe it's not going to change. There are huge business reasons why a matrix management law firm at a certain size needs to be organised like that. It will win in the market if it's organised like that, and it ain't going to change that. The issue, therefore, is partly for the person, so what, therefore there is some need for the person to think about how they become more resilient in that situation. So how, in that particular example, they learn to say no, they learn to give themselves permission to say no, they learn to recognise that they are not putting themselves out there as being an unambitious, unaspirational person by saying no, and that actually very successful people prioritise and are good at saying no. Um, and they have to learn that themselves, but also I don't let the business entirely off the hook in that area because that's where resilience training comes in. So we're not going to change the fundamental issue here. We are going to be matrix management organisation and there are going to be loads of people chucking work at people, but we're going to help you by helping you by giving you some personal resilience training. So I think it's important to dissemble those two things and to work out what you're going to do in each of them. Sorry, can I add, yeah. add just add one more one more thing on that? I, I think the in our business and in our customers' businesses, the number one challenge that fits in that bucket, the way it is, yeah. is change itself. And and so actually one of the things that people find most difficult, most stressful is is change. And the reality of our marketplace is it, it's going through the, the biggest change in a generation. Yes. Our marketplace is we are, and I think as an organization and as individuals that's a key area for support and being sensitive and giving people the tools that they need to be successful. And my own view is there are very few organisations now that are not changing you know, at a pace they've never seen before. And, and to my mind, if I were focusing in on something that was almost cross-industry, the ability to manage change and be resilient in those yeah. in situations yeah. would be key. Always. Hi, I'm Louise Aston. I'm the Wellbeing at Work Director at Business in the Community, which Paddy chairs and John's a member of. And the real barrier is you can't manage what you can't talk about. It's great that John has talked about his experience. We can't get any business leaders to talk about mental health openly. What do you think it's going to take to make that happen? Can I, can I ask if you mean mental health or mental illness? Mental health. So they won't actually talk about looking after their own minds and being healthy. They, I suppose it's actually it's both things. It's about, so I was with the chief executive last week who said he knew that many of his senior people had suffered from common mental health issues within their organisation. And although he was a very open chief executive, they wouldn't come out and talk about it. Uh -huh. um, but then there's examples like Antonio Osorio from Lloyd's. And he's a success story. And, you know, again, what's stopping them? Mm. No, we're, we're at time, so I don't really want to answer too long. I think the reason I asked whether you mean health or illness is obviously that I think we go very quickly towards disclosure and talking about illness. And that can often ask a lot of leaders to be 
saying, you know, talking about their private life, their health conditions, and that. Actually, what about what they do that's positive? What about looking at role models? What about great chief execs, you know, great leaders, and asking them how do they keep themselves in good shape? How do you set those positive examples? And I, I don't think we've done enough trying that. And actually, then it becomes easier to talk about when it didn't work. Because if you set that culture first, where, oh, we're all looking after our minds, this is all part of how we do good business, then, oh, what, what did you do when you had that problem? Oh, yeah, well, I did more of that, and I also did this extra thing. Oh, that sounds interesting. I should try that. If we become all on the same side, and then it's so much easier to talk about it. We don't create the artificial division in the first place. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep the questions, yep. <clears throat> uh, so it's not a question, it's more of a plea. So I'm Ollie Smith. Um, I work for Guys and Services Charity, uh, one of the people that has, has funded Andy. He's very kindly said that makes us enlightened, which I will take. <laughs> uh, so I was pretty disappointed with your answers on the five million quid, if I'm honest, guys. And my plea is, is don't get sucked into working the way the system works now. I used to work in the Department of Health under the last government when there was money. Uh, we'd spend £30 million a year on tobacco uh, control advertising, £25 million on change for life. Do you think there was a huge difference in obesity rates and smoking rates as a result? We saw some difference, but not a huge amount of difference. One of the most exciting things that's happened in public health and tobacco control recently is e-cigarettes. And it's come from completely left field, nothing to do with government at all. Now, you can say what you like about them, whether they're good or bad. But I, my plea is don't lose what I think is really special about Mind Apples, is that you, you come with a different approach. Yes, you are based in, uh, you look at the evidence base and you absolutely um, kind of take that, but you package it in an exciting way that really appeals to people. So don't get sucked into public health campaigns and RCTs just for the sake of it. Do it if it's absolutely necessary, but keep that, keep that edge, keep the excitement, because I think that's really what's going to change things. And that's what's special about you guys and why I think Mind Apples is such a, is a, such a fantastic organization. So would you recommend a, a Mind Apples tree in every, on every high street? Is that the, is that the approach? <laughs> That's right. Let's go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. Yes. I, I, I find myself getting more concerned with, with the answers that, that have been coming because Excellent. it sounds like what you're saying is organisations make impossible demands. Uh, we need to help people cope with these impossible demands yeah. rather than we need to stop organisations making impossible demands. Uh, so, you know, the lawyers can cope with the impossible hours, the partners in consultancy firms uh, can cope with the ridiculous targets that they've got rather than saying to organisations, don't make these ridiculous demands. Well, Rather than get him to say, no, I didn't, yes, I did, no, I did, but I'm not sure I did say that because I, I think I said in my two buckets exactly the opposite of that. I said, there are some things which are, it's just what it's like around here, and there are some things which businesses do which they shouldn't. And I gave examples of what, 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 the, what those were, uh, or not all of them, but, but so I, I don't believe that it's all about resilience and nothing should change in the business, but neither do I change, believe that one can absolutely turn commercial businesses into something completely different overnight that don't put some demands on individuals. So I, I, don't, I don't quite accept them, that's why I said. It, it always comes back to the serenity prayer. It's just give me the courage to change the things I can change, the grace to accept the things I can't change, and the wisdom to know the difference. And we need to get businesses to the point where they have the wisdom to tell the difference between stupid things that they shouldn't do because it harms everything and inevitable consequences of working in a difficult market that they need to support people through. And most of it is probably in the former category for me. And an example I would give actually isn't really from health. It's you know using the same incentive system for your front of office and back office in a financial services firm where you've got a whole load of extroverts in the front office driven by targets who love bonuses and a whole load of collaborative people who really take pride in doing a good job in the back office being completely divided by the one tiny bonus that one person in their team gets and everyone's very jealous of it. That's just stupid, don't do it. And it's not really a health point, that's a business point, but it comes from understanding the minds of your people and then you can do a great deal more to get the best from them. Yes. Uh, so, um my question is about big data. Uh, and um, I run a construction and property development company, which probably means that I've got lots of people who are actually being stressed on a regular basis all over the country. But uh, one of the things that I've got on my wrist is I've, I've got a, a kind of one of these digital kind of doodars that actually tells my 
uh, phone what my heartbeat is and how well I'm sleeping and all that sort of stuff. Um, what's the application of that kind of data to the world of the mind? And uh, do you think any? Do you think businesses are going to be having bits of kit which are going to be able to help some of their employees and customers as a result? Um, so I think I mean there are certain physiological factors associated with things like stress and your heart rate, blood pressure, and so on. That sort of thing that that those that I think digital doodle you should trade that trademark that quickly uh, before anyone else gets it. Um, that they, that they can measure so sort of clear physiological responses to certain situations. The worry I'd have is that that does start getting pretty personal. Um, would you be happy with your employer tracking? <laughs> toilet, well, precisely, yes, toilet breaks. Um, very, um, yeah, personal characteristics, heart rate, blood pressure, and so on. What, what the business need would be for that, I don't know. Maybe some businesses could make a case for that. I know that Amazon tracks its employees incredibly carefully, and they don't have a particularly good reputation for looking after their staff. So I think there would be, I'm sure there would be some, some fascinating um, insights you can gain using big data if you wanted to track all of your employees. But I'm not sure, A, what the sort of justification would be for doing that. And B, I would that there would be a lot of sort of concerns about the proximity of the employer to, to an individual if they're actually physically being tracked. I think there would be a lot of ethical concerns around that. Yeah. OK, I will um, draw the kind of the formal part of this evening to a close. Um, please join me in thanking Andy, John, Natalie and Mark. Can I, can, I just also say, can I just also say a big thank to all of you, you for coming and also to Paddy for, for hosting us and, and to uh, Liz and Kate and Kerry for hosting us here at LexisNexis um, and also to Esther and Alex for organising everything behind the scenes and uh, we, we really look forward to seeing you back at the bar looking after your mental health. <laughs> <laughs>